Great, so um, I hope you guys have been having a fantastic reInvent so far. Um, this is something that is a repeat. This is something that uh, Ishrod and myself have worked with HashiCorp to put together something that we've gathered from best practices across working with our enterprise customers. And hopefully you can take away some uh, learnings from this today. Uh, to be clear, um, we're very familiar with the open source community. We know that this is um, actively used day to day. Um, given this is enterprise uh, focused, there is going to be a lot of focus on the use cases, the best practices and functionality around sort of enterprise and what we're seeing our enterprise customers using uh, Terraform, Bolt and Console in capacity of anywhere from pro-serve engagements to production workloads that scale on AWS. So a quick show of hands, everyone enjoying reInvent. I hope you guys have got uh, what you've looked for out of reInvent. Um, I hope that this has been really useful for you. And thank you for coming through to spend some time with us today. Um, who's this person talking in front with the South African accent? I'm Trevor Hansen. I'm the senior solution architect that works with HashCorp. So for the last two years, I've been working with them extensively around integrating with our products, uh, with go-to-market activities, as well as helping enterprise companies implement these solutions uh, to serve their customers. My name is Rashad Bush. I am a senior solution architect at Amazon Web Services. I've been at the company for about six months, and this is my first reInvent. Um, I'm going to come back on the stage to do a deep dive on Terraform Enterprise with a cool demo. Right now, I'll hand it over to uh, Trevor. Thank you very much. Great. So before we kick things off, I just want to do a show of hands. Who currently uses HashiCorp's products in any capacity today? Excellent. So there's a good um, amount of people in the room that could potentially even teach me some things. So if there's anything that um, you would like to discuss further, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you guys after this session. Um, a quick question, how many of you are from software integrators and consulting partners? Excellent. Um, quick show of hands, how many of you are at an enterprise company today using some form of HashCorp's products in production? Excellent. Fantastic. Well, if there's any, anything I can help with them, um, if there's anything that you're interested in additional services and things, reach out to me. I would love to help you there. So what are we going to be diving in today? Um, for those obviously very familiar with HashiCorp's products, the cloud operating model, I'm going to frame everything we talk about in the context of the cloud operating model in how we're doing these best practices on AWS. We're going to be talking about the Terraform landing zone solution. This was created in the ProServe team with um, our common engagements that we see with enterprise customers. We've created this based on best practices from HashCorp as well as AWS. And this is actually a preview. If you guys are interested in actually starting to use this in any capacity, it's highly flexible. It's based on an open source concept. Um, it has enterprise functionality. It's, it ties into everything that we've seen on a multi-account multi strategy. This is something you guys can use. So definitely, um, we'll dive into that. We're going to be talking about Vault Reference Architecture. We're going to be talking about the use cases of how you can connect these things in an AWS environment and being able to sort of create that centralized solution. We're going to be diving a bit into console and how you can actually use that for sort of that digital transformation. And we're going to unpack once again the use cases and best practices there. And then, as Urshad mentioned, he's going to come up and do a hands-on demo. This is something that he's created that code's available for you guys to actually go and take away and use and dissect as you wish. Um, we've also created a workshop with GitLab as well. And it's GitLab Terraform Cloud. It's got some enterprise functionality there to be able to grab a whole bunch of Terraform configuration deployed to AWS environments. This is running from the HashiCorp booth. It's also a workshop that we can come and do with you on site as well. So if you're interested, next year we're happy to come and spend some time with you over there. So I'm going to dive a bit into the cloud operating model. Um, excuse those that are already familiar with this. I just want to get everyone up to speed. So HashCorp has done a fantastic job to frame their tools in that journey between sort of the provision with Terraform, the secure with Vault, and um, connect with console. These sort of have really resonated with our enterprise customers, and I'm sure you're very familiar with these products today. I'm going to focus on these three layers to start with. Uh, Nomad, um, that's something we can dive into a session on its own. So why are these products important? We're realizing that with cloud, it's opened up a whole new world of benefits. But as enterprise companies, we've realized there's still a lot of constraints and regulations and things that 
you know, you've got these really big monolithic applications that you're migrating into the cloud or you're going through some form of transformation, you're realizing there's a couple of critical changes that are happening. You're no longer having standalone servers. You're no longer having sort of these VMware or, you know, hypervisors that you're running yourself. You're moving towards sort of these um, request a, a service or computer as you wish and being able to scale up and down. So it becomes very dynamic. How do you work in an environment where, you know, an enterprise company is moving potentially hundreds of their applications to the cloud? This transition is incredible for opening up opportunity and creativity and being able to innovate on behalf of your customer, but it opens up additional problems and pain points. The next aspect is moving away from a very IP-based environment to a very dynamic, very DNS-focused, a lot of moving parts. You know, some of your teams are going to be moving into containers. Some of them are going to be going towards sort of a serverless environment. How do you use these products to keep all those products centralized? So as you can see, they kind of layer on top of each other. They've done a fantastic job linking those all together. So what is Terraform at a core? I'm, very, I'm hoping this is uh, something that you guys are very familiar with. There's a wide range of providers that are you know, deeply integrated into a whole bunch of APIs. I think it's over 100 providers today. Um, obviously, within AWS, you can use Terraform to go and provision those resources, much like being able to interact with VMware and also being able to do things like Datadog. I personally work with Datadog as well. So when we go in and we do enterprise engagements, it's very frequent that we're seeing that companies are starting to adopt using Terraform to go and deploy a workspace with Datadog, for example. And this is really going to stand out in the Terraform landing zone solution that I'll show you. So the typical sort of workflow there, you're going to have you, as you guys may be familiar, is you're going to be able to define your infrastructure as code in a configuration file. And you've got a couple of commands there to be able to go and take action on that. That is actually going to go and apply those configurations in the cloud for you. And this is essentially going to go create that desired state in, um, in the environment. It's not going to drop out a state file. That state file, we all know if you've ever played with Terraform before, this is something that you want to maintain, you want to keep, you don't want to lose it, because this is critical if you're going to continuously innovating. So as we mentioned, there's that day one experience. We're going to be, you know, I want X, Y, and Z resources in AWS. Now you start moving towards, you know, as a user, you start, you know, adding in databases. We all know that our applications evolve over a period of time. There's a lot of relationships and dependencies that are happening there. So as you see, a single user, I'm defining my resources, I'm applying them, they're going and taking action in an environment. That drops out a state file, I'm going to refresh it, keep it in sync, right? This becomes a little more interesting when you start moving towards multiple users working on the same project. You're going to introduce the notion around um, a version control system. You're going to be adding in things like a state solution where you can actually go and put something in S3. Anyone who's um, had a bit of a struggle maintaining their states in some capacity? Fantastic. So I would love to know if you guys are still having any problems there. Um, there's a lot of creative ways I've seen, but today we're going to be talking about those more in detail. Now we start moving towards your company starting to adopt these products, and you realize that you're having to um, you know, maintain a lot of different uh, groups and sort of version controls and sort of these workflows. And now you're starting to have teams creating their individual workspaces. So the networking team starting to create their environments. They're starting to surface some functionality up to the application teams. And then you have sort of the monitoring teams and all the other things. Plug in your business unit here. Yeah, everyone starts operating in their own lanes. So this is when um, HashiCorp really decided, you know, the open source community is really well adapted. They've done a fantastic job. But as an enterprise company, how do we meet them where they're at with the functionality that they existingly um, are traditionally aware of, you know, without having to go change teams, what is the features that are coming into that? And we can unpack that at Slipey. So we saw one of the first critical things that they put in place was being able to put in sort of these permission boundaries and connect to your sort of existing LDAB environments, your authentication platforms. So being able to create logical grouping and assign permissions and identities to those. The next is being able to clip into a version control system. So I personally work with like GitLab. Um, and it, for you that may be working with this, there's a couple of different options that you have there. But version control, being able to have multiple people working on the same project, I'm sure we're all well aware that you, know, you want to be able to have sort of that continuous integration workflow pers perspective that you're not having people stepping over um, on each other's toes. And you're keeping a good state of every change that has happened over a long period of time. This hands over to state management, so enterprise really has unlocked a lot of uh, crucial benefits there with state management. Something that actually I really personally enjoy what they've um, launched was Terraform Cloud, which Irshad will be diving into as well, which also handles that state management for you. 
as we mentioned, that's uh, sort of making sure that you, you're lining up those deployments, that you're not going to step on each other's toes. Some enterprise companies we've seen, you know, they moving potentially hundreds of applications over a short period of time into the cloud. You're seeing that there's a lot of changes that are happening in a very short period of time. Having the power to make sure that you have this at the infrastructure level, at the workspace level, and the application level is, is crucial. And it's something that, um, you know, initially when you start growing a company, you realize how these powers come in play. Environment variables. So when you have obviously a whole bunch of different applications that you're maintaining, you want to make sure that the blast radius is really reduced without having to store anything local and being able to put that up into that uh, Terraform environment. Modules, we're going to unpack this a bit more in the Terraform Enterprise, um, where we're talking about the landing zone solution, where you're able to, within an organization, be able to define sort of modules that are specific to your organization or sort of the blueprints, if you will, allowing your downstream customers internally to leverage these modules. So, you know, you have a, a small core team creating these infrastructure in a service catalog way, being able to say, you know, the application teams that work with Kubernetes, we've got a couple of best practices around this. We want to create that module and give it to them. And the Terraform landing zone solution that we created really streamlines this process to make it easy to serve your customers. The private registry is essentially where you're registering those things so that people can actually grab those and deploy them within their environments. The Sentinel policies, for anyone who sits in a government uh, and requirements around security and making sure that you're putting in good guardrails to make sure that you're not exposing a database to the world, you're not putting something that infrastructure as code is not opening up a port that you don't want to be opened. You really want to enable the developers downstream to be able to have the full functionality to innovate in the cloud as they wish, but having Sentinel to be able to define the policies and permissions around that. Once again, Airshot is going to be giving you access to that to show you a bit more around what that is as well. So I've mentioned a lot about the Terraform Landing Zone solution. So our ProServe team, if you've ever worked with them, you know it's our professional services team that work with you know, some of our most demanding customers that are transforming the most legacy environments to you know, transforming them to um, these modern application development workflows. And they really saw a common pattern across this landing zone that enterprise companies are trying to implement. You know, we've seen some companies for over six months to a year trying to implement their own landing zone solution in, in some capacity. And we realized that this is a common repeatable pattern where we can help. So we decided to create something called the Terraform landing zone solution. And this enables you to essentially go and use all the traditional things that you would be using within the multi-account strategy of AWS. So what were customers really looking for? They want to be able to move to the cloud and start building and innovating at a rapid pace. They want to be able to move fast, as we said, not just fixing all the problems that come downstream from uh, you know, customers' uh, bugs and requests, but also being able to leverage the wide suite of things that you know, we launch on, on a frequent basis. You know, a lot of the things we launched over this reInvent is innovating on behalf of you as a customer. Once again, you want to have developers be able to leverage those things to improve the experience of your customer. But the common pattern we see across all of those is security is job zero for everyone. But when you're working with you know, an organization that traditionally um, you know, has got thousands of, of different moving parts, you have anywhere from you know, a couple of different development teams to you know, a thousand applications running at any point in time, you want to keep a, con a consistent pattern of security across that. And this landing zone solution is really catered to make sure that those things are possible. Security, as we said, one of the best practices on AWS, we saw that multi-account strategy became a crucial thing for enterprise companies, creating this vending machine around sort of organizations where you can deploy a new AWS account for a new customer or a new application or new organization units. When you go down this path of creating a landing zone or being able to implement this yourself, the first thing you realize is, you know, it's easy. We just need to enable a couple of IAM policies. We just need to deploy a couple of uh, permission boundaries, maybe deploy our sort of networking best practices based on our organization. But for anyone who's tried to implement something in a multi-account strategy in any capacity, you realize that six months later, you've got 100 different moving parts, and it takes you potentially, you know, hours for an account to pre-warm itself. 
With Terraform and, the, and this landing zone solution that we have now in a preview that you guys can start using is actually going to help you with that full automation around that to make sure you've got a consistent deployment regardless. So as we said, this can expand to multi-accounts. It can start with three accounts. It can go up to a potentially thousands of accounts. In some cases, we see customers doing that. And it essentially establishes that security baseline. So it goes, it creates that account for you. It deploys all the things that you need. It's highly flexible. You have a lot of um, flexibility to include um, anything that you need on top of what we have there. And what we are helping you with, you can deploy and change that as you wish. On AWS side, we initially introduced the, the AWS landing zone. This is a very cloud formation based uh, service infrastructure as code as you may have known. Um, we saw AWS Control Tower, we made it a lot easier, we gave a service for people to be able to um, automate this a lot easier. But there's, there was some limited functionality, and as you guys are obviously very familiar with, companies have a mandate or they prefer to use something like Terraform because it's something that really resonates with them being able to use multiple different providers, interact with a lot of different environments. You may have a mandate to use Terraform or you just have a preference, but the Terraform landing zone solution is what we want to focus on. So, as you can see, um, Terraform Landing Zone is something we're going to dive into. This is something that obviously it's going to go provision those multi-accounts. It's going to go um, expand to third parties. We've got a couple of examples on this as well. But one of the crucial things we did is when we're going down this path, we worked with our enterprise customers based on their requirements and a couple of different uh, customers that went through this initial phase to get this um, sort of uh, landing zone implemented so we can share it with everyone. We actually worked with HashiCorp extensively to make sure that AWS best practices were included, as well as HashiCorp's products as well. We set up some form of initial security and gov governance. You know, we can't cater for all of them. You know, you have something that's there in place to be able to get you to sort of a benchmark. But if you have any additional requirements or, you know, governance or um, security requirements, there's a lot of flexibility to implement those things on top of that. So if you're going to be adopting something like this, happy to work with us to be able to understand how we can improve that functionality. The next is this manages the core account deployment. So it actually goes and provisions core account services. For anyone who's gone down a multi-account strategy or organization, you want to have an isolated sort of security account, a monitoring account, a networking account. These become crucial in, in that um, adoption. But the account vending machine is where we really um, see the benefits of this. Because a new team comes on board or a team is starting to expand into more accounts, you want to be able to vend AWS accounts within the governance and requirements of your, your typical environment that you are in. But you want to make sure that they're maintaining the security posture that your company requires. The final most powerful thing, it's fully automated. Once you've got this all wired up and everything's going well, Essentially, it's got a self-service form um, based on sort of how you've set up the authentication based on your LDAB or third party or SSO. You're able to get people to go to a sign up form. They go fill in a couple of details you specify based on, you know, if I'm part of this application team, it's going to go vend that machine and it's going to pre-warm everything. So what is it going to be doing from a high level on this Terraform landing zone? Initially, the only manual component for anyone who started working with AWS is that master account. So the master account is the pair account. Everyone knows we need to go jump in there and configure a couple of things. But then after that, you can actually start using Terraform to be able to go deploy the rest. So we actually go and create sort of the shared, um, the shared account services. So if you have any services that you want to be able to share from a centralized location that can be shared out to your whole organization, we're able to go and deploy that. We create that initial logging account. We create the security accounts. These become crucial, fundamental um, sort of um, foundational accounts that get used because we're going to deploy Terraform Enterprise on top of that. We also go and deploy your version control system of preference. So if you got like, for example, GitHub or GitLab, we're going to go and put that out there in that as well. But this is where the power kicks in. It's going to go start provisioning sort of that core accounts and organizations. It's going to configure your supporting services. And we'll talk about that shortly. So let's say if you have an S3 bucket, you know, that you need to configure within how your company wants it. Say, for example, you want to enable encryption on an S3 bucket for everyone that uses S3 buckets, it will go and configure these things and be able to uh, make those available. It will go trigger the baseline. So it's going to go deploy sort of that v VPC and networking layer for you. Highly customizable. You can go and change this as you wish. You obviously have all your own requirements with your new organization. It's critical that you can go and customize this. It's going to go deploy that security baseline. 
one thing to note, it goes up to, I think, 59 different services that it's going to interact with to be able to create all the best practices around a security posture. How does this look when that automation happens? So somebody goes, they sign in, they request uh, an account gets created based on their sort of uh, security or how they have access to a particular environment. This is where that automation of the Terraform landing zone, zone solution is going to kick off. As we said, it's going to use Terraform to deploy everything. So it goes and creates an AWS account based on the organizations within your environment, creates an AWS organization account. It's going to go do the account baseline things. It's going to go put things in place for you. It's going to go create that security groups. It's going to drop your IAM policies based on the best practices and permissions you have in your organization. Depending on your organization units, you've got a lot of different security and permissions that you want to be deploying there. It's going to go enable sort of the auditing logging environments there for you. It's going to set up your networking. It's going to go drop the code repo for that team so that they have that code repo there for them to start using it. You don't want somebody, when they um, request an account, they're still asking, hey, can you please go drop a version control system in place for me? It's going to be there for you as well. It's going to go drop Terraform there for you as well so you have sort of a great um, sort of registry area where you can push things out. Um, and, and there's a couple of other options there. It's going to go put your single sign-on. You know, enterprise customers want single sign-on to be within those AWS accounts. Essentially, when all those things are completed, the requester actually gets notified, hey, your AWS account or, you know, has been requested, and it's completed. Once they get access to that account, everything is wired up, and it's pretty much got governance, security, and compliance, all busy monitoring to make sure that that account is maintaining your enterprise posture. So how does this look from an account level? As we said, we've got that master account. We go and deploy those core um, organizational units, those AWS accounts that are fundamental to everything else moving around it. As we said, we're going to go create some um, you know, different um, workspace uh, sort of environments. Look at these as sort of organizational units where you can define service control policies that apply to those environments. If you want a particular um, you know, developers to only be able to, to work with certain services, you can really control what they can access and what they can't access. So if a developer requests the developer account, you can define what happens in that environment. Same as sandbox, same as testing and archiving. Once you finish using an account, you, just, you don't want to kill it and you don't want to lose anything potentially valuable on them. Anyone who's you know, closed out an AWS account but wished they saved something or you know, even though it was a sandbox account, there was maybe a good you know, code pipeline in there. There was maybe some S3 bucket with files that you really wanted to have access there. So an archiving policy becomes crucial. But now we get to the core value proposition, right? All of these things are undifferentiated for you guys. You really want to focus on how you guys differentiate as a company. So this is where the line of business component comes in. In your organization, you have a whole bunch of different line of business. You can name this as you wish. You know, every single team is going to have their own potential production, non-production environments. The landing zone helps you be able to go and deploy these things. So what do we actually go and deploy? So I've spoken a lot around the security that we're going to put in. We actually go and enable the VPC flow logs. We're going to enable the CloudWatch. We enable a Cloud Trail. We set up um, guard duty. We enable it in those regions. Because best practices, you want to make sure that even if you're not using that account or that sort of uh, region, you want to be able to know that if something's happening in that environment, you don't want to find out at the end of the month that something has gone wrong or there's been somebody um, you know, misusing an environment. Then we spoke about third-party tools. We see a common one is Redlock that's come up. So this Terraform landing zone solution supports Redlock, but highly expandable. You can go and add additional things here. Bear in mind, these are detect, uh, detective aspects. The preventative aspect, we spoke about Sentinel. If any of you are using Sentinel, this will actually go and implement the Sentinel policies that you have. So you can bring your existing Sentinel policies into this environment, and it will help those guardrails. KMS, you can use KMS, you can put in Vault, uh, we're going to speak about Vault. Secret Manager, once again, we're going to go enable that. Some customers wanted this, you can turn this on or off, you can customize it as you wish. IAM policies, we're going to go put those policies in that account for you. Then we got service control policies. We mentioned defining what resources you can touch and you can't touch, organizations and so on. And then once again, extendable via third parties, single sign-on, Okta. We saw this become a frequent request. So the Terraform landing zone solu solution supports Okta, but once again, scalable. 
So we spoke a bit about curated modules. So let's say, you know, within your organization, you want people to be able to use an S3 bucket, but you really want to set up some guidelines around how your company should be using that bucket. This landing zone allows you to create these curated modules so that any service in AWS, you can really include all the best practices and things that you want part of your company's organization. In this case, we want to enable a couple of things. We want to make sure encryption is enabled on that. We want to in access logs. We want policies. Whatever those permissions and security best practices that you want to enable, you essentially put those on and you create a curated module. You know, this is the private registry. Anyone who comes, they, you know, a new developer, it's my first day on the job. I don't want to be able to go put a request in to say, hey, I want to be able to have an S3 bucket. I want to be able to grab this from the registry and it's got all the best practices wired up so I can just do my job as I've been asked to do. As we said, the most powerful aspect we made sure that you guys have a true benefit, it's essentially an open source thing that we are giving to you. It's not something that you have to pay us personally for. Um, I don't get any commission on this, as, but ba purely because we've seen this as an undifferentiated thing for, for you as a customer on AWS. You want to be able to take something like this landing zone and accelerate your adoption of expanding into using products on AWS. Highly scalable. We've seen customers take this to over a thousand accounts and they are continuously growing this at the moment and we're seeing it being able to adapt to that. It's self-service, so once you've got it all lined up, essentially anyone who joins the organization or if there's a new line of business that you stand up, everything is automated on the back end once you've got this all going. Essentially, when you see companies moving through that you know, transformation to the cloud, usually what you're seeing is they're bringing their old habits with them and they're really stuck with sort of these sort of idle or you know, these process request uh, processes. We really don't want to have those guardrails up there. You want to make sure that um, you know, you're not blocking people from being able to use the things that they really want to use. If somebody wants to use EKS or if they want to be able to spin up a container or if they want to use a Kinesis stream, we're not stopping them from that. You want to make sure that people have access to the things that they can do best. So you don't spend weeks going through a request process. You essentially have an automated process that can help the bear. Everyone that deals with auditing, this is a real powerhouse. You're able to continuously audit and be able to pull um, any specific questions that you have there. Any additional things you want to add there, we can work on that as well. Lastly, as I cannot stress this enough, this is not prescriptive. It's, it's a framework that we're giving you that you can customize as you wish. Now we've spoken a lot about Terraform. Let's talk about Vault. Anyone using Vault today? Cool. So Vault, uh, for those that do not know what Vault is, Vault is moving away from you know, the sprawl of secrets and uh, credentials and things living all over your organization within uh, you know, environment variables, within local sort of storage locations. There's a whole bunch of different places you're going there. And one of the things we've seen companies adopt it for is to create the centralized components. So it's incredible to see how many companies are adopting this and the more they become familiar with the use cases and the features that Vault provides, the more powerful it becomes. Some of the most security aware companies that we work with that operate in, in, in these highly compliant and secure environments, Vault has become a crucial player in that environment because of the power that it gives those developers downstream. So as we all know, authentication and authorization has got a couple of different things. It's those username and passwords, it's those database credentials, it's TLS certificates. We've all had that time when we have, you know, trying to maintain certificates and make sure that we get it before it expires and not have any problems there. And API keys, anyone who's gone through an API key storm, you know, when you're going through developing, testing, staging, and you're going through this at a rapid rate, all these things we just mentioned becomes, it becomes a pretty potential high-risk opportunity because when we're going through innovation and testing, a lot of times we don't think of security as the, as the first step then. So what did Azure, I mean, what did they actually try and do here? They decided to centralize this. When you look at how Vault has come in and actually enabled this best practices, they decided to bring all these things and take all these security requirements and put it into a centralized location and make it API driven so that anyone in the organization can leverage the benefits of Vault. So one of the first things, enabling those things to be encrypted at rest. You know, that's the best practice out of the gates. The next aspect is anyone that's communicating with Vault is going to be able to securely communicate and it's going to be encrypted traffic. The last component there that I want to talk about is fine-grained access control. You can really define which users and applications can access what level of what um, sort of credentials there. 
dynamic secrets. You know, we've moved from this, everyone knew which server was responsible, there was a particular DNS or IP address we would go to, and that would be application server two, for example. Now, when you have this, you know, an application that's scaling sort of in a, um, in, into hundreds of potential clusters or EC2 instances or Lambda functions, you're realizing that the blast radius is really bad if they're all using the same credentials. So being able to give them an, uh, an identity and assigning them a unique sort of ephemeral uh, credentials to access that database, we can immediately no now know if that application on that particular instance was the vulnerability, and you can obviously add um, a revocation in that area. So you can actually go reduce the blast radius significantly in these areas. The last aspect, anyone who's done with cryptography, this becomes a really, really challenging thing, and it also becomes something that you don't want to be in a position where you've exposed potentially you know, 10, 50, 30, um, a million different credentials out there, or social security numbers, or credentials um, for sort of um, you know personal identity information. You can now use Vault in this capacity if you aren't using this at the moment. It's a really powerful feature that your application now can hand off that sort of cryptography to Vault and being able to interact with an API on Vault to be able to say, hey, I'm an application, I'm grabbing credit card details, I'm gonna be storing this locally for a short period of time, but I need to make an API call to, to Vault to be able to quickly encrypt that data and it's gonna make sure that that stuff is kept secure. So you can go and create those keys, those keys can live in Vault and it really becomes powerful and highly scalable. So what does this look like? Customers are going to be authenticating through a couple of different areas to Vault. So obviously in the beginning, IAM policies, you know, permissions, you can use AWS authentication boundaries around that to define which users and applications can communicate with Vault. Much like your LDAP, you know, a lot of us have moved from, you know, I've been working with, um, you know, Microsoft workloads for, for years already, and, you know, LDAP is an enterprise thing, right? We really want to be able to define organizational units there. It's powerful because it can connect to these things. You're starting to adopt things like Kubernetes. You know, there's going to be, um, you know, users, groups, and those things in there, that area. Vault can connect to that and provide that native experience. So application A is able to communicate with, you know, that particular database. Vault is going to allow that to be able to happen. We know that, um, you know, whenever these applications and users start requesting a database, for example, you want to make sure that you have a good trail history there. So th there's a powerful use case where you can actually now drop these into Splunk. You're able to drop these into, you know, any auditing backend where it becomes powerful because you can have your teams to go and audit based on what was happening on the backend. It's really powerful when something starts going wrong or you're seeing a bit of an inconsistent trend. You want to go be able to go back and see what was going wrong there. The next aspect is you don't want this to be a single point of failure. So Vault does support that power of you dropping off the state or the storage of the backend into a database of its kind. So you can connect this to console, for example, and console be able to hold that backend so that the core Vault can actually be become a highly available environment and have that storage on a backend. You can also put this into a database um, of choice, and it has a couple of good options that you can include there. The real power now comes in where Vault connects to additional things. So you're going to be able to say, hey, these are key values that we're storing in there. We want to encrypt those. The next aspect is those database connectors. You're going to be connecting to, let's say, let's start off with the MySQL database. If Vault is connected to that MySQL database, it's able to go and broker new credentials out to the application that's sharing it instead of having that um, user continuously requesting with the same username and password in those cases. IAM roles. We all know that best practices, if you've ever gone through well-architected reviews, rotating those roles and credentials and giving short-lived access becomes powerful. Vault has good uh, um, connectivity to that. Your public keys, we all know that public keys is, um, it's all caught us off guard at some point. You're able to now use Vault, obviously, to go and communicate with that and be able to um, deal with that, um, the brokering of those keys to the applications and users that are actually allowed to communicate with those. SSH, this, you know, storing those PEM files is always something that, you know, we all have uh, gone down that path of creating sort of um, access with one PEM file to hundreds of EC2 instances, for example, and it continues, goes down that path. You check that in once somewhere, and that could be a, a single point of failure. With Vault, you can actually connect it, be able to broker out some new uh, PEM files to an application for a short period of time, for example. 
Now we look at a highly available situation. You know, Vault supports highly available out of the gates, so you can actually go and create sort of that primary node. Within AWS, we obviously recommend having things at least across two to three availability zones. You can have Vault actually go and create those sort of read replicas that are sitting there. The applications also support connecting to console. We're going to dive into console shortly, but this becomes powerful because it can use console as that back end, and it can also point the customers to that primary node. Anyone using console at the moment? Anyone's voice gone after speaking a lot at reInvents? Yeah, anyway, so console is another tool that I want to quickly give you guys a bit of a, um, a context on what this does and how it's currently used as well. So we're moving away from sort of this host-based static IP address environments. You know, we have a server, it's got a particular IP address. When you move into the cloud, Instances are coming up and down, they're changing all the time. You're having containers, you're having a lot of different moving parts, and you want to be able to move over to sort of a very dynamic environment. And you really want to have a single source of truth where all the right things are at the right time. Vault solves this problem of moving away from that very legacy old school approach where you're sending an application request to a particular IP address, or you're telling, you know, this is my DNS server, for example. So how does this look in a traditional environment? You've got you know, potentially this monolith application, or you've got multiple applications sitting in within um, with one environment, or potentially even in one box. What's happening is those applications sort of know exactly where they need to be going. You know, you've got a, a couple of different applications that are very dependent on each other. And in a, a really well-established world a couple of years ago, y this was easy to maintain. You're moving over to something where where you're now moving into AWS and your teams are starting to break up. They're becoming two pizza teams, as you may have heard about you know, what we do within our service teams. But essentially what's happening in those, those apps are maintained by different product teams. They're starting to move at different paces. They, they've got a lot of different moving parts. They, you know, they decide to leave a load balancer. They're changing to an API. There's a lot of changing paths there. So how do you maintain sort of, you know, not just ABC uh, there, how do you go up to 300 applications and make sure that these applications know how to communicate with each other? So if you translate that to AWS services, you've got a couple of um, you know, service teams on your side that are using EC2. You know, some are starting to, they love the, the change of Kubernetes, they decide they're gonna go with EKS. How do those applications know where the database is gonna be you know, when the database team is making changes all the time on their side? This expands to a whole bunch of different services. So as you can see, there's a lot of services that are being adopted. This is where the power of console really comes in. And for anyone that hasn't played with console, this is something I encourage. Go and play around with it. There's a lot of really powerful things there. Think of this as a service mesh like with, you know, on steroids. It's helping you with a lot of things. So when an application is, let's say, on an EC2 instance, and that EC2 instance is running app A, for example, what happens is it's going to stand up, it, you know, based on the IAM policies and roles and permissions of that application, it's going to be able to have that sidecar to be able to call Vault and say, hey, I'm you know, application A, I'm ready to take some traffic, I'm able to serve my customer. So what's going to happen there, it's going to register itself, and it's going to put itself in a catalog. All the other applications now know exactly where service A is going to be. Because console, remember, is continuously brokering with all the proxies on all of these boxes. And what's really powerful of this, it becomes really easy to discover. So when, let's say, an application on that ECS, you've got your uh, Elastic Container Services team, you know, they're doing a fantastic job creating their app. All they need to do is point to where console is telling it application A's identity is. And whenever it makes that request, it's going to know straight away where that is. Bear in mind, it's got a sidecar agent that's going to help with that. I missed one there. Configuration. We all know that when we start expanding really fast, there's always this configuration file that we're passing into an application. When application stands up, it says, hey, console, grab me my configuration file. You can centralize those configuration files for your application. So it becomes really powerful to make sure you've got a single source of truth of what application version you're running, where you're pointing an application to communicate with this database, et cetera. Segmentation, so you can really now um, define that service graph. So you can say that application A can speak to application B, but it can't be application A to C. You don't want somebody to jump in through sort of a, a, you know, a little web server to be able to speak straight to sort of the social security database, for example. You really want to be able to define that. 
and you can control that and you want to be able to audit that. You want to be able to give an application an identity. Every single um, version of that application is going to have a unique uh, certificate associated to it so it knows what it's an identity. It's going to speak to another application and it's going to say, hey, I'm application A, this is my identity. If it's not allowed to talk, it's going to bounce that and it's all highly um, sort of uh, audible. So if you have, as we said, those proxies, you have two applications, they need to speak to each other, their sidecar proxies are going to be able to communicate with each other. Let's say you have defined that A can speak to B, application A and B. What's really powerful, it deals with mutual TLS. So that communication between those two applications are now going to be encrypted for you. That handles that for you, and it becomes really powerful. So this is where I hand over to Urshad. Um, I really hope some of this has been really in, um, you know, informative for you guys. There is you know, a lot of best practices that we see continuously surfacing up from our enterprise environments. This Terraform landing zone solution is something that we created from our ProServe team. If you're interested in, in working with this or taking a look at what it is, come and reach out to me. I'm happy to help you with that. A lot of you put your hand up using um, you know, our products today with, uh, with HashiCorp in conjunction. I'm the solution architect, so if you're facing any problems or you need any help, come and speak to me. I want to make sure I get those problems solved for you or at least put you in contact with the right people. And I hope you guys have a really good reInvent further. And um, he's going to hand over on a demo. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. All right, so uh, in the next few minutes, what I'm going to talk about is a kind of a deep dive on Terraform Enterprise and some of the other components which are uh, included as part of the offering. And then I'll give you a cool live demo. Uh, hopefully, Wi-Fi works. Um, so some of the points that I will be talking about are, are listed here. Now, there are a number of delivery methods. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you raised hands on uh, being users of Terraform, uh, at least open source. So you start with the CLI, meaning you uh, download executable binaries and then start using Terraform um, CLI from your laptops, from your desktops. And then the, the other offering is Terraform Cloud. Um, and you can sign up at, at uh, Terraform Cloud for an account. And, and for certain features, uh, they don't, they don't charge. This is a, a free account. And then the, uh, we have the, uh, the top offering, which is the Terraform Enterprise, where you know, uh, it's essentially the same offering, but then you have the option of deploying it on-premise and using it. Uh, let's say you are going through some regulatory compliance or there are some requirements of hosting it within your uh, data centers, uh, then you can have the Terraform Enterprise. Now. State management. Uh, Trevor talked about uh, state management, right? This is really a pain for a developer when you use uh, the CLI, because you have to maintain state, the state file, uh, which is essentially uh, the, the, the way uh, Terraform knows what is actually deployed in your infrastructure, in your AWS account. Um, now, in Terraform Cloud and Enterprise, all you have to do is there's a concept of organization. That's what you see on the slide. Um, and I'm going to show you that in the demo. This is a top level artifact in your account which you create um, and then within the organization you have workspaces. Think about workspaces. These are your um, workspaces map, mapping to certain environments. Let's say you have a development environment or you have a production environment and then you have the hashy uh, configuration files sitting in a source control repository. Let's say GitHub GitLab, et cetera, and then you can map those files using the workspaces. Environment variables. So um, normally when we use CLI, uh, the open source, you know, we really have to take care of the, um, the two keys uh, which are extremely important for the AWS account, your access key and secret access key, right? Now in Terraform Enterprise, you get to store these variables as environment variables so that nobody can see them. And then there is on top of that, there is encryption automatically applied, right? Uh, nobody has access to these environment keys when you store them um, uh, using your uh, setup. Sentinel. Um, 
Trevor talked about Sentinel. This is policy as code. Let's say one of the requirements in your organization is that you want to limit the blast radius of your developers, okay? So that they don't go in, in, in the uh, AWS account and then go and launch instances. So you can define policy as code where you can actually limit their blast radius by specifying certain rules in the policy. And then this can easily plug in into your Terraform phases, like the Terraform plan, and then uh, after the plan, you can have the Sentinel policy, which triggers in, and then the apply phase. So you have visibility into um, who is doing what. Um, so, so this is without Sentinel, right? Uh, you have the source control repository, uh, and, and then you have the uh, hooked up to Terraform Cloud. And when you do a plan and apply, you have the infrastructure provisioned. But then when you have Sentinel, what Sentinel does, it comes before apply, which I'll show you in the demo, uh, meaning that policy at code arrests this uh, after the uh, plan, and then you, know, you can have a tight control on what actually goes in the infrastructure based on those policy statements. Version control. Now, one of the things that the developers struggle with is having the continuous integration and continuous delivery of the infrastructure as code, right? Um, and then we do a number of things. So Terraform Enterprise gives you access to, there is built-in continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, which also I'm going to show you in the demo. So right now, uh, GitLab, uh, GitHub, and all of these repositories, these version control software systems are supported. I'm going to show you um, a demo with the GitLab. Uh, one of the other cool features is um, before you actually provision infrastructure, what if you need the visibility into cost estimation. How much is it going to cost you over a period of a uh, month if you, let's say you are provisioning an EC2 instance of certain shape, right? And then before actually your developers provision uh, resources, um, all of the resources, let's say including compute instances, you need to have kind of a cost estimation of how much is this going to cost you on a monthly basis. So you get that support from Terraform Enterprise as well. All right. Are you ready for a demo? OK. So I'm logged in uh, into my Terraform Enterprise account right now. And then all of these features that you see on the, on the, on the, on the left. Um, so you have the users. You have Teams, um, and then you have ECS providers. Right now, I have, what I have done is I have hooked up uh, a GitLab repository. In GitLab, again, GitLab right now, what I have, GitLab. In GitLab right now, I have the hashi files, and I have also the Sentinel policy files. Um, and then um, I enabled the cost estimation that I was talking about a few minutes ago. So it's a matter of checkbox. Um, and then you get this facility. Uh, built in. And then the policy uh, sets, which is Sentinel, right? Policy as code. You write code, enforce the code, and then again, it's coming from one of the uh, repositories in my uh, GitLab. Okay, so these are all of the settings. And now, if I go inside my workspaces, right now, what I have is I have. Um, one workspace, which is actually a very simple uh, a repository where I have uh, uh, hashi files for creating an EC2 instance and installing Jenkins on top of this. And I'm ready to uh, share the code. And then if I go ahead and then from the UI, right? Very powerful. So you have the ability to run a plan. So you queue the plan. Um, and then what it's going to do right now is, it's like you are doing using CLI uh, Terraform plan. That's the first thing you guys do, right? When you 
when you try uh, the infrastructure provisioning using Terraform, the first thing you do is basically to see what it does, right? And there are a lot of things behind the scenes what Terraform does. It also gives an indication of what it is actually going to do when you apply um, uh, finally at the end of uh, the, the phase. Now, what you see now is uh, the plan is still running. As part of the plan, after the plan, you have the cost estimation. This is a matter of that checkbox that I talked about, right? You enable the checkbox, and it's going to give you an indication of, right now it's estimating, it's going to give you an indication of, hey, this is going to cost you about $66 uh, some cents monthly if you provision this particular um, set of uh, resources in your infrastructure. That's very useful, right? And then the policy set and all. Now it failed. So, so I had the policy set up saying that, um, and there are options in, in Sentinel policy. You can do, uh, there are a couple of options, three options. Right now I've set it up hard mandatory, which means, hey, if there is a violation of the policy, do not proceed. Just, just stop the, the, the plan itself. I don't want to proceed. Okay? And then the indication is here, false meaning there was a violation, and then the policy details are here right now. So what it tells me that there was a violation of a specific uh, sentinel rule which I had set up. Now, just to give you an idea, that's the source code of the hashi files, and this is the policy uh, statement, right? What I have done, I have set it up as, as you can see, enforcement level, hard mandatory. You have two other options, soft mandatory, and then advisory as well. And the policy is, if I go inside the file, uh, which I have set up here, at the bottom of this is, hey, I need a tag called name on the EC2 instance. Now, if I go back to my Cloud9 e, how many of you have used Cloud9 e, Cloud9 ID before? Okay, so I'm using Cloud9 right now, and if I look at the source code, what I see is that there is no name tag, right? So what I will do is, as part of this demo, um, make sure that I have this applied, and I save this. Now I go back here to my command uh, line interface and then CICD, built in automatically. I'm not teaching Git here, but just to give you an idea that how it works. So it tells me I have modified and then I go and um, let's say commit the change. Um, oh, let me add this first. Okay, add this first, and then I commit, and then finally I say git push. So I'm pushing it to the, I'm pushing it to the, um, to the GitLab, my source control. And all of a sudden you will see now, because of that, that it will trigger a new queue plan automatically. We're not implementing CI/CD here, it's built in. From the, uh, from the Terraform Enterprise, Terraform Cloud. So then after this, because I changed the policy, uh, this, this time it's gonna go and, and run the same uh, uh, phases, like the, the, the plan first, and then uh, it go, it's gonna give me the indication of uh, the, the cost, and then finally it's gonna give me um, that's what happens with uh, uh, the live demos, right? Okay. Sorry, sorry, say that again. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like. Yeah, so the idea is basically to, to give you an idea of how 
the whole process works, which is like end to end, you know, you have the source code in, in repository, and then you have the, uh, the, the, the cost estimation, that's the Sentinel policy, all of that implemented out of the box. Um, so that gives you an indication. Um, let me bring Trevor back on stage uh, because uh, we want to talk about a couple of things first, uh, which is um, the uh, survey towards the end. You know, we value our feedback, and that's typically how we work. Uh, if if uh, you guys go ahead and then put the feedback there so that, you know, we can make it better next time. Mm -hmm. That's the intent. And also, like Trevor talked about, yeah. the, uh, the game day, you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, quick show of hands, who picked his closed brackets on the Sentinel policy removed? Fantastic, yeah. So it looked like uh, when you cleared out the slashes, you removed the closed brackets. Live demos, anyone who's done sure. those uh, knows that. Guys, thank you so much for coming through. Um, we created something called a game day, which um, is a, it's a gamified workshop where you can actually go through and learn how to sort of connect Git, uh, GitLab or GitHub environments to Terraform Cloud and be able to deploy a whole bunch of uh, workshops, right. including a Vault workshop that's on top of that. So take a, um, a walk past the ha uh, HashCorp booth. They've got um, sort of access codes that you guys can access that environment. Um, but safe travels for everyone. I hope you guys had a fantastic time at reInvent, and we really appreciate the time that you guys had here today. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you.